Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, thanks for coming to this Centre for Liberal Cities uh, lecture series of Standards and Cities. I'm Tan Kai Bo, I'm the Chief Executive of Spring Singapore, which is uh, Singapore's Enterprise Development Agency and also Singapore's National Standards and Accreditation Board. Now, Singapore ranks amongst the world's most livable cities. Indeed, we are quite a unique city with a somewhat unique way of life. I think about 85% of the population live in government housing, which is actually not usual. Like this iconic 52-storey HDB flat that you see on the top right-hand corner. Downtown of Singapore is sort of an eclectic collection of office towers sitting quite comfortably side by side with old shop houses like you see here. And we love trees and we sort of plant real ones and iron ones together next to each other. I'm quite comfortable with that. And we actually do have quite a good first world public transport system, despite our own occasional complaints about it. But I think Singapore is also unique in that it is not just a city. It is actually also a full-fledged economy with its own bustling industries. And that presents a different set of but overall, I think we will all probably say that Singapore has much to be proud of. But what has all this got to do with today's topic, which is standards? Actually, quite a lot, because almost everything. I think construction standards determine how buildings are built. Environmental standards, emission standards, they set the quality for clean air and water. Efficiency standards, they basically set how well we are managing our energy and other scarce resources like water. And similarly, if you look at public transport standards, they help to establish what intelligent, efficient public transport systems should look like. And safety standards assure that the safety of goods and services to consumers are guaranteed. So all these underlying, all these different things that we almost take for granted actually are different standards that have been set. And with technological advances, with climate change, with aging population, with increasing resource scarcity, I think really the standards landscape is also changing. The standards that affect the sustainable, the comfortable city living are definitely up for review. And this is where I think this forum can provide some inputs for and uh, actually your participation will also be the most welcome. Like I said just now, SPRING really is an enterprise development agency and it's also our national standards body. So in the area of city living and city planning, there are several areas that we have been actively developing standards for. Which I captured here. So we look at it not just from the economic perspective, really, we look at it from also the social, the environmental, and the infrastructural perspective. And you will see everything from how electric vehicles are done, what is meant by energy efficiency, what is waste management, smart grids, smart metering, sensor networks for smart cities, to areas where we are still sort of struggling to define the problem and to manage it. There are even areas that we call silver industry. Not, not so much the gold and silver industry, but the, the silver hair industry. And I think there are, there are definitely standards that need to be developed to ensure that our cities are easy and age-friendly to be lived in. We are also a part of the International Standardization Organization. So, really, 
Singapore as a national standard body is also a member of ISO and in fact we are part of the ISO. So a lot of things we do here actually are not just for setting Singapore's national standards, but we also discuss, monitor, mirror the work that is being done internationally. So national mirror committees are set up to monitor the standards development related to livable sustainable cities. And in particular, currently we are involved in two of the technical committees, so to speak. One on the sustainability of buildings and civil engineering goods, and the other on smart community infrastructure metrics. This, this so-called mural committee basically consists of stakeholders from the industry, including regulators, infrastructure developers, academy, and so on. So this is also a slide where I put out advertisement to ask for those of you who are here who are interested in this area to also please come see me or come see my colleagues afterwards. I think there are several possible platforms to be involved in, and that includes technical committees, working groups, monitoring of the work, uh, industry dialogue sessions, conferences, seminars, and so on. This to ensure that the standards that are being developed is relevant and is useful. Now, it leads me to just introduce the two speakers. Actually, they've uh, broadly been introduced. Mr. Terry Hill is uh, the president of ISO. He took on the job for, from 1st of January 2013. Civil engineer by training. He has global experience in creating and implementing infrastructure and transport projects that bring benefit to communities all around the world. And between 2004 to 2009, he was the chairman of Arab Group, which is a big multinational with 11,000 staff, independent firm of engineers, planners, technology consultants. I think their first project in Singapore was apparently done in 1972, OCBC building, I was told. Terry holds a degree holds degrees in civil and structural engineering and economics. He's a non-executive member of the Cross Rail Limited Board and a fellow or member of many professional associations including the UK Royal Academy of Engineering and the Institution of Civil Engineers and the World Economic Forum. We also have Rob Steele, who is uh, the current Secretary General of the ISO. ISO is uh, sort of formed almost like a board and executive structure. So Rob's full-time job is essentially the CEO of ISO. He's been doing that since uh, 2009. And he was previously the CEO of Standards New Zealand, which is the New Zealand equivalent of Spring. And he's a chartered accountant by training. He's a member of the New Zealand Institute of Directors and a fellow of the New Zealand Institute of Management. And during his tenure as CEO as, uh, of the New Zealand Standards Body, Rob represented the SNZ on the ISO Council and the Council Standard Committee on Strategy and the ISO Technical Committee Board. Sorry, Technical Management Board. He was also the Secretary of the Pacific Area Standards Congress from 2002 to 2007. And in his career, Rob has worked in the private sector in New Zealand and Canada in many roles. He's the chief executive of an electricity distribution company and proud to them in providing senior management advice to clients of Deloitte on financial audit and organizational finance. And he has served on several boards as the director of companies in the manufacturing and service sectors. Why did I just play that visit video to you? Well, two reasons. One, yesterday was World Standards Day. So if you were feeling particularly happy and what have you, that's the reason why. Uh, maybe not. But more importantly, standards are all around us and standards are used by you voluntarily, and maybe sometimes involuntarily, almost every time of your life. So standards for bicycles, standards for buildings, standards for all sorts of things. And to the point of the discussion today, um, a particular standard that ISO has published, ISO 37120, uh, a standard on city indicators. Just to outline the presentation, I'm going to tell you a bit about this standard, and then Terry is going to talk a little bit about you know, uh, how this standard and other standards work into uh, some of the key uh, projects that Arup has been involved in uh, globally. Let's talk about a city for a minute. 
Cities are complicated things, aren't they? Here you've got infrastructure running underneath the, the streets, you've got gas, you've got water, you've got sewage, you've got transport systems running through the city, you've got the issue of how do you get people in and out of cities and the like. So it's a complicated thing. And some of the, some of the things that we've been hearing about and talking about in Singapore this week really reaffirm that. You know, the Centre for Livable Cities uh, and the Building Construction Authority running a, a seminar on Monday, a seminar that we had yesterday on infrastructure. Earlier this year, the Centre for Livable Cities and the, and the huge uh, uh, work that uh, they were doing for a major conference here in Singapore on the World Cities Summit all go to that point. Just before I get into that, let me tell you a little bit about ISO. How many of you have had anything to do with ISO in your lives before? Cool. Everybody should raise their hands given the video, right? If you've got a pair of socks, you're involved in an ISO standard. I'm sorry, but there you go. So ISO is 160, now actually 165 members. Each member is the peak standards body in their country. My point, we're an international standards organisation. Second point, we have over 20,000 standards in our catalogue. Everything literally from nuts and bolts. You know, there's a standard for a nut and a bolt because they've got to go like that. Right through to standards around social responsibility. Issues such as nanotechnology, biotechnology, all of these sorts of things. If you touch it, we probably do something about it. Hopefully to help you. We, have, we produce around 1,100 standards a year. It's roughly three every single day. And we have over 650 organisations in liaison. So we have liaisons with the World Trade Organisation, World Health Organisation, issues such as that. Here is what ISO has got up to in the last five years, and you might have real trouble reading this, but my point is not to dwell on this. My point is this is new work that ISO has, stand has started in the last five years including issues around um, innovation, issues around uh, water, issues around energy. These all relate to cities as well as more broadly, uh, I guess, right into your world, both today and tomorrow. And so what's the point of having an international standard? The point about having an international standard is so that there's comparability. If you want to send a particular product from Singapore to Europe, and you have one standard in Singapore and another standard in Europe, you have a problem. It's called a technical barrier to trade. In a similar way, in the subject area that I'm talking about, if you're using one set of indicators to measure a, a city's performance and another set of indicators in another city, it's not, it's not possible or it's very difficult, or more difficult, to actually compare across the two. And I think we all learn by sharing. Yet yeah, this is not a, I mean, it is, it is competitive in terms of cities as well, but some of these things I think we really are looking for comparability. We're looking to learn from each other. We're le looking to, to build on, on each other's experience. And so to the standard itself. The idea of, of this standard is to, is to have a whole series of indicators, and I'll, I'll get to just the extent of that in just a minute. But the idea of having indicators is to help cities assess their performance and their progress over time. You know, the old adage, you can't manage it if you can't measure it, really, really resonates, I think, here in this particular area. And obviously, the ultimate idea of this is all about people. It's about improving the quality of life and sustainability of the people in cities. And let's face it, you've heard these statistics before. 50% of us live in cities today. 70% of GDP comes from the activity in cities. By 2050, 70% of us will live in cities. So the opportunity to actually improve cities and the economies in which cities reside is huge. So the idea of having a uniform approach to enable cities to seamlessly compare where they stand in relation to other cities, as I've already said, I think is really important. 
These are the areas that are covered by the standard. Looks a bit daunting, doesn't it? Everything from education to transportation, fire and emergency services to shelter, water and sanitation to the environment or recreation. But if you stop and think about it, these are the things that are needed in a city. So what's the benefits of using this standard? And why should ISO develop a standard on this when there are already indicators out there? Well, you can see the, the, the benefits on the screen. I'm not going to read through them in the interest of time and, and two in terms of making sure that you stay awake. But I think the real point here is that the benefits of using the standard are comparability. Not to say that every city is equal. That's not what we're saying. But the opportunity to be able to benchmark, the opportunities to set targets, the opportunities to learn from each other is really important. And this standard was developed not just by a group of people based in Europe. This standard was developed by 20 participating countries in ISO, plus a further 16 countries as observing the work and commenting on that work. So 36 countries around the world, both from the developed and the emerging economies, both from large cities and from small. So as I've already said, who can use this, this, this standard? This, this standard can be used by any city, municipality or local government that wishes to measure its performance in a comparable and verifiable manner. It's objective. It's, it's not dependent on size, location or level of development. It's the first city for uh, sorry. It's the first standard for city indicators, and it's being developed as part of an integrated suite of standards for sustainable development in communities. And I'll come to this in two seconds. You can see the scope there about wanting requirements, guidance, and supporting techniques and tools to help all kinds of communities and their related subdivisions and interested and concerned parties to become more resilient and sustainable, and to demonstrate that achievement by solid metrics. And the idea is that we will have a series of international standards that will encourage further development and implementation in a holistic sort of way. In case you need some more information on this, and you will not be able to read the, the yellow script here uh, given the colour, um, the Smart Cities Council is currently doing a series on this standard. And what we'll do is we'll make these, I'm sure the the Centre for Livable Cities will make this presentation available for you to download. If you click on these, one of these links, you'll see that, that they are talking about the standard and aspects of the standard each week. So th this is an opportunity for you to understand a little bit more. It's not really possible for me to, to dwell on the details of this, and you probably don't want me to. But here's, here's an example of some of the indicators. One of the, one of the sectors we talked about, or was on the screen a moment ago, was education. Here are some core indicators and some supporting indicators around education. So what's the percentage of female school-aged population enrolled in school? And the, and, the, and the supporting one, what's the percentage of male school-aged population that's enrolled in a school? So you can see there is a depth of analysis here and kind of you can ask the so what question as a result of that. How does this help a livable city? How does this improve? over time, uh, how a city will operate and work for its citizens, for the people living in the city. And so I've gone relatively quickly. But there's an outline, if you like, of, of, of the standard itself. It's, not, it's a voluntary standard. No city has to use it. But there's an opportunity for cities to use it, to share ideas, to share best practice, to benchmark where they want to be, and to set their own targets. Indeed, they may not choose all of the indicators. They may only choose some, because ISO develops voluntary standards. We do not have any power of mandate, or any mandate to, to make things mandatory. So with that, if I hand over to, uh, to Terry Hill, the ISO president and former chairman of, of Arup, to continue the discussion. Thank you. I, um, uh, I, in a way, I don't want to talk about Arab because we're here to think about cities and, and talking of, uh, and, 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 and see where ISO fits into that. But it will help you to understand where I'm coming from 
um, in, in understanding what I'm going to be saying. Um, so, uh, yeah, Arup, uh, as, as you were just saying, has been here for a long time uh, in, uh, in, in Singapore. In fact, it was probably one of our first um, uh, offices to open when we, when we started going. Um, and uh, the sort of projects and work that we're working in, um, probably for about the last 10 years, yeah, well, step back a bit. Uh, we started off as consulting engineers. In fact, we started off as structural engineers. Uh, and then we started adding different types of engineering uh, to, to the services we offer. Then we started bringing in planners and ecologists and economists and so on like that. And it started getting difficult to explain what we were. I think if you look on our website, it might say uh, a whole range of things, engineers. And then somebody, it suddenly came to one of our people, actually... What we do is cities. There's not much in a city that we don't get involved in. Um, and then um, once we started realizing that climate change was real, um, that sustainability was all-encompassing, we started putting all these things together and started thinking, how should cities really be best um, uh, developed, grown, improved? So. We started looking at that uh, and, and realizing that if we do do cities, we better learn a lot more about cities to get it right. Um, so we're involved uh, in places around the world. In fact, I was just talking earlier. Um, we, we have been involved in some of the eco cities in China, and you know we've got the we've got the bruises to prove it. Uh, we've we've we, you know, it's, it's 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 been tough. Uh, this journey, but with each of those, um, we've come out of it a little bit, a little bit wiser. Um, and so we then start doing city modeling um, and trying to see, and it does get complex, because as Rob was saying, cities are complex things. But I don't think something being complex should actually stop us. For goodness sake, if it was easy, you wouldn't need brilliant people like well, those from Arab. I mean, you know, we do difficult things, so that's what, that's what we try and, try and get our teeth into. And so, um, actually, that's a page from our intranet, um, but you can see there a lot of the publications and guides that, that, uh, that we've got in, uh, in Arab. Actually, even though it's on our intranet, you can probably get most of these on our, on our, on our web page. Anyway, it's dead easy, www.arab.com. So... Um, uh, we've done some work for the UK government, looking at what is the market for thinking about future cities. Uh, urban, urban mobility and a smart city age, designing with data, we'll keep going back to data, shaping future cities, smart cities uh, uh, market, as I said. Um, innovating, innovation in cities, um, international case studies on smart cities, solutions for cities, analysis of views with it. Uh, sensing cities. Um, I've only just learnt uh, this, this, uh, this little factoid that 90% of all the data, 90% of all the data that exists now was created in the last two years. We are creating data at phenomenal rate. The cost of, 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 um, of sensing and the cost is, is gone down so it's only a few cents for understanding what, what, how our cities function, how... Um, uh, um, yeah, traffic, uh, pollution, all that sort of stuff, we can, we can get that. The point is, how can we make sense out of these sensors? Um, so we've got a whole unit now uh, uh, that's growing. It's probably our fastest growth um, uh, group within the firm are about smart cities. And everybody talks about smart cities. What it's about is about how to conceive uh, and run uh, better cities through the exploitation of, of, of data and digital technologies. Um, and so there's a few things that we're doing recently. Uh, recently um, at, at, um, uh, we're looking at dis digital master planning for cities because cities have the opportunity uh, to, make, uh, to exploit their data. How do they start getting into, into this? Um, uh, Nordic solutions for sustainable cities we got appointed by the Nordic nations to start looking at what, are, and, and that comes up with 18 actions which these countries are now taking to exploit 
their digital data. Um, in the UK, we've got uh, a series of research and innovation funds called catapults. I uh, don't really like the name, but the idea of a catapult is it, it propels you from that early pure research stage into practical solutions uh, because so much clever stuff just disappears because nobody knows how to exploit it properly. So we've done work there. We've got one of them called the Future Cities Catapult, and we've actually looked at what already exists in understanding future, future cities. Uh, and then in our uh, urban, uh, Arab Urban Life Network, because it's, it's not just good enough to have a group of experts who look at smart cities, we're now exploiting all the 11,000 people across the firm with this network, which is the Arab Urban, Left, uh, Urban Life Network, to understand what is going on around the world in all the... Because there aren't many cities where we now do not have an office, and therefore we can feed in what it is that's going on elsewhere. But this is the big baby of, of them all. This is a piece of work that we did a few years ago for the C40 uh, cities uh, work. Uh, this was established, I think it was called the C20 originally, then it got to C40. We're keeping it as C40, even though there are now 75 cities involved in, in, this, in this network. And this is a practical network to help city managers actually understand what best practice is. Because, you know, all cities fail. Hang on, this is Singapore. Well... As has been said, and you keep being told, this is a pretty special place. And actually, in it, you can see the fruits of what other cities should be doing, at least the seeds of what other, other cities should be doing. By, com by combining city and state, by combining the country's national government with the, state, with the city administration, there's an awful lot of efficiency, then, comes into how to run a city. When you think about it, it's crazy, isn't it? Because cities have existed for 7,000 years. That's the record. If you go back, then the first evidence of a city is about 5,000 BC. Okay, it was probably like quite a lot smaller then. You know, technology wasn't what it, what it, what it is today. But never mind, never mind thinking about it was, what it was 7,000 years ago. Just think what has happened in that time and why it is we still don't properly know how to run a city. And uh, 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 Teng Chai and your, and, your, uh, and your CLC, your Center for Livable Cities, is at the leading edge of this, and yet still it is something that requires... Because um, cities are complex things. You know your, your computer, evidently your computer has got an operating system that runs in its background. By the way, I am an engineer, so every now and again I'll just flip into, into thinking about, you know, just totally, that seem obvious to me, but they just don't happen. But, but that's, that's because, uh, you know, politics and human behavior come into it as well. But, you know, your computer runs and there's an operating system, you know, it just hums in the background. It probably doesn't even hum. You don't even know, but it's going in the background. And it's just looking after stuff. It's just watching stuff all the time while you're going it. The issue is, why don't cities do that? It seems as if they always just need looking after. You've always got to be tweaking them. They just don't, they're not, they're not sort of like a self-correcting mechanism. And I find that surprising, given that we've been living in cities for, as I said, 7,000 years, and we're going to live in cities more and more and more. So, you know, it isn't as if we should just go around saying, this isn't good enough, get back to the countryside, get back to your farms, villages, or whatever it is, because that's the idea. No, they're going to, we're going to have more and more. So we'd better get it right, because really this is the future. There is no other future. There is no plan B, as people say. It's going to be... And the other daunting fact, and now I flip again, you know, the thing that I do is big mega infrastructure. That's what I like doing, metros and water systems and energy plants and so on. I like, and, and the last few days we've been seeing some of the stuff that's going on in Singapore, and it is awesome. Um, that actually, as we come to realize that the number of people, the number of cities or the number of people living in cities 
is going to double in the next 40 years. Is that the number? I mean, you know, we know all these numbers. Uh, I think it's, that's, that's what the forecasts are showing. Right. Just try and work out the consequences of that. Just try and work out the consequences of that. It means that, that every subway system, every waterworks, every school, every bit of road, every public library, every concert hall, everything that you think of as a city, we've got to do again. Now, okay, you might quibble with me with that. You might, I mean, there's a wonderful academic analysis that was done in the, uh, in, in the University of San Francisco, which actually looked at um, uh, regression analysis on size of cities. What it actually found was that there's a 15% efficiency by doubling in size, that actually cities get more and more efficient the bigger they are. So if we are going to double the number of people living in cities, then maybe it isn't quite double. And we should get better at doing cities. But what we found with this work with the C40, and what this C40 does, is look at those 40 cities. Does, I say there's more of them now. Uh, we actually looked at all of the challenges facing cities. And every city is different, I know that. And so what we did, we gave each city a different task. I think, uh, I think um, maybe it was Manila was given, was given flooding to look at, I think it was, uh, and what's, what's, what, you know, adaptation and so on to that sort of thing. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Johannesburg was given actually sort of digital and what's going to happen. About, but each city, and then they started comparing. So this report here is a state of the cities for all those 40 cities and, and man more and came out with 4,734 4, climate actions, because these are the recommendations. Because what became quite apparent when we were doing this work was that cities don't have an empowered parastatal organization for mayors. They have networks. This is a network, this is just, but there are other ones. There's one at the World Economic Forum. There, there are other networks, but there's nothing with the equivalence that has clout and power. between. So if you were a mayor and you've just been voted in and you turn up for office one morning, do you know how to run the place? Actually, yes, you follow on. You just tweak it from what was done before. But actually, there is no model. There's endless models about how to run companies. Companies have got so much academic analysis and economic and done of them and management handbooks and so on, how to run companies. There's actually quite a lot of models about how to run countries. But there aren't models, well, there are models to run, to, to, to run cities, but there's no agreement about what is the best way to run. So this is trying to help mayors talk to each other by swapping Quite honestly, practical answer. Now, who was it who said it? it might have been Mayor Bloomberg. Also, there isn't, there isn't a capitalist or a socialist way of cleaning the streets. So it isn't about, it isn't about politics for that. Um, so, like uh, CLC, C40 is indeed a valuable arena. Um, but as Rob was saying, actually there is no way of comparing Manchester with Mumbai. Now, be careful, I come from Manchester, so I'm not asking you to rank one above the other. All I'm saying is, at the moment, we haven't got the metrics. And what, um, what ISO has done is try to go, uh, and it is, it is uh, a, well, uh, as a complex area, yes, but it's also a fraught area, because you look at the list that Rob was saying, be that he showed you there, be interesting to see whether or not you think that is comprehensive, whether you think that everything's covered in that list, you know, education, security, uh, transport, all the various characteristics that are in there, there are ways in which you can measure and then you can compare them. So my view is that ISO has only just started getting engaged in this debate about how cities should best be managed. And it has taken an obvious first step. Let's define our terms. Let's make it so we can talk to each other. Because one of the, you know, the, the ultimate aim of international standards is to break down the barriers for international trade, remove them. But it also provides a common language so that at least we know what we're talking about when we talk to each other about cities. Um, I'm, 
you'll recognize the name, Livable Cities, but this is a different one. Uh, this is a, uh, a project that I'm involved in in the UK, uh, where we've got eight million pounds from the, the, uh, the EPSRC, that's a research fund, uh, and we're working uh, then with these different universities. I'm on its audit committee that's looking at, uh, at, at, and so we've got city analysis methodology, resources, well-being, well-being. What about well-being then? We've actually got these metrics, but what is well-being about? And if you look over at the, why am I involved in this? Because it says on the right-hand side, we want to transform the engineering of cities to deliver global and societal well-being. As I said before, we've got to do everything that you know about a city again over the next 40 years. So we better get, it, we better get doing it better. And my contention is that, and this is what we've been talking about this week and last week, my contention is that infrastructure, of cities have not yet had their technological revolution. And some people start asking me, well, what, do you, what on earth do you mean? Have it? Well, I don't know what the technological revolution for infrastructure is, but then I didn't know I wanted an iPhone until I saw it. I didn't know I wanted to mess around with computers by whizzing my finger backwards and forwards across the room until it, was, until it arrived. And so there's a lot of things that happened. I didn't know that on a jet engine you could save 40% of the fuel over the last 10 years. If so, 10 years ago, if somebody had said, let's just met, make planes 40% more efficient, I think, wow, I have no idea how to go about that. And yet that's happened. So it's had its technological revolution. If somebody had said, just close down all the, all the supermarkets and bookshops, because you don't need them anymore, because you can just click on, or, or even with your finger, just dab on a screen, and the thing you wanted will arrive, I wouldn't have thought that. Technological revolutions provide things which now are essentials that you didn't even know about before. Now, I don't know what that is for infrastructure in our cities. I know that people keep telling me, eventually I don't, will not need to travel, because I can Skype or whatever it is, backwards and forwards, and do everything. And in my company, we do that all the time. We just wrap away around the world 24-7. And yet still, I like to come to Singapore and see people. So I think that there is a revolution to come in cities and how cities are going to be provide how the infrastructure for them are going to be provided and the cities are going to be run and iso is right in the center of that we've been looking at it and we're hearing all sorts of in the last few days we've been hearing of all sorts of things from the uh, land transport um, uh, authority uh, delivering the metros from the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the provision of public housing, uh, from the PUB with, with, um, uh, with, with water supply, uh, with the amazing um, uh, uh, hydrocarbon storage, underground rock caverns. Uh, and in each of those, the leaders, the experts in each of those ended up by saying, of course, the stuff we've been doing doesn't yet have a standard because there are some stunning things going on in Singapore. And therefore, for us to be able to see how we can roll that across lots and lots of cities across the world, we're going to need more standards that represent be best practice. Now, I think at that point, I'm going to stop now. Uh, I could then start talking about, talk about how do we get best practice in standards, which we could talk about. But actually, at the moment, let's just stay there and say how wonderful it would be if our cities could be run as smoothly as our computer operate, I know you've probably all had a computer that's crashed. Okay, never mind. Let's hope cities, cities, we're not going to have cities that crash, but, but that they just hummed gently in the background uh, whilst we got on having a ball in our cities. Imagine if cities were smart, green, and much cheaper. That's what I think we could do, helped by international standards. Thank you. Um. Maybe while you are thinking about your first question, I can start by asking some of the easier, more technical questions. <laughs> Actually, a question for Rob is, with the standard that we just talked about just now, right? you have so many different dimensions, and I presume the dimensions are not um, additive. You can't quite add it up and sort of say, well, just because your total score is better, you are better. So is there a certain um, thinking about how are you going to try to either recognize or um, encourage 
cities to be better run? How, how, what is the framework for doing that? Yeah, thanks, Taiho. I, I mean, I think this standard doesn't exist in isolation. You know, you, you're going to have uh, city plans already there. You're going to have your uh, what, what you're thinking of doing at the moment. And so I think you can take several approaches to this. As I said at the start, it's a, a voluntary standard. So you could, for example, look at your existing plan as a city, and you could say, what are the metrics? You know, if you like, treat it as a shopping list. Um, you, I'm, I've got some very uh, high importance and, and areas around education, for example. Look at the metrics in there. Um, it doesn't have to be done all at once. It doesn't have to be done all, uh, all, at, all, all the time. But, but I do think that thinking about this in the long term, where would you like to be in the five or ten year period, I think is really important. And I also think that it's really important to, to be open because I think in almost anything, and including in uh, looking at where your city is going, uh, to be able to share information, I think is really, really important. If you are looking, for example, again, at education, is there a city out there that you would, you, you would admire, that you would think is best practice? Can you share data with, with that city? Can you dig in behind the metrics to look at um, uh, how they are doing it? So it's not just numbers for numbers' sake, it's being able to manage those numbers, to be able to look at those numbers. And those metrics have been put in place, as I said before, um, not to be uh, specific to any one city. They're there to be able to be, a, to be uh, quite comprehensive and uh, for people to share cities, I, uh, share uh, data rather. Yeah, I think the Centre for Livable Cities, I think is a, is a fantastic opportunity to share best practice, to use these metrics and, and, to, and to work together. When I was here in Singapore earlier this year, I attended the World City Summit and that to me was an absolute revelation. I think it was 160 mayors, is that something like that, yeah. roughly? Um, there, all talking together, uh, exchanging information and what what to me was a bit shocking actually was how how most of them had never heard of ISO so it was a great marketing opportunity for me as well thank you very much other questions yes Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Dr. Gay Min, and um, I represent the Nature Society. So you can see I know nothing about engineering and uh, planning. But I have heard of ISO because uh, I work in a hospital, and um, uh, which is trying to be ISO certified. So my question actually is about human behavior and how much you take that into account when you're doing your planning and your management. Because my experience with ISO is the hospital was very frustrated because oh, one of the problems they were having, the management was having, is doctors would not fill in the right, um, uh, well, they, we filled it in, but they objected to our handwriting. So we didn't fill it in in a way that could be read, and therefore it did not meet ISO standards. That's what we were told. So we were urged by management to write more neatly, but that's practically impossible. So, you know, I think all these standards are excellent and very admirable, but in certain areas, especially in cities, obviously um, the population in Mumbai behaved totally differently from the population in Manchester, are you going to take that into account and leave it as it is, or are you going to have standards for behaviour as well? And how are you going to sort of overcome the gap between the two, between the infrastructure and the software? Thank you. Thank, thanks for the question, um, and, and a really interesting one as well. Uh, uh, so let me answer this from an ISO perspective, and, and, and maybe actually Ting Chai might want to comment but as well on this. So ISO 9001, I assume, is what you were talking about in the quality management standard in your, in your hospital. Um, I think what ISO is trying to do is to try and set out a performance base to what 
you are trying to achieve. So one of the key points about an ISO standard, particularly a, a management system standard, is this whole idea of planning, doing, checking what you've done, and then acting to, to correct and improve. I, I'm not sure that an ISO standard should be blamed for the, the writing, uh, the legibility of writing and, and what have you. So, and, and, I, and I don't say that flippantly. What, what I'm trying to say, I think, is I think in that particular instance, maybe the management system standard or the management system itself could be one, it could be, there could be two things. One, I think it would be really good if the management explained why they want to collect the data and what they're going to do with it. Because I think there's a lot of form filling out. If it's, if it's just filling out the form to file the stuff somewhere, then that's not particularly useful. So I think that plan, do, check, act issue, I think, is really important to explain. And the second thing, I think, is um, we should be looking at uh, what are the priorities. You know, if, it's, if it's absolutely key to ca capture that particular piece of data, then we should be working with people to do that. ISO is working a lot in the area around societal issues. I mentioned during my speech, for example, we have a guidance standard on social responsibility. That's all about people. And that's been written, I think, probably with a broader audience in mind. And maybe some of the things that we should be doing is actually involving more of the community that will be using the standard. I think that's something we need to continually strive for. Yeah, um, uh, I, I, I knew I had, be had to be careful if, if you st uh, stood up to, uh, to ask a question because we were talking outside and, and I, asked, um, I, I asked you what you thought about the gardens by the bay because that, that was an Arab job as well. And you said, do you want me to be candid? And I thought, oh, right, okay, be, ca be careful. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't know if in our, in our uh, uh, Sanders process we do make allowances for unruly rebels and renegades um, who, who don't fill in the, the... But actually, it's a really important point. Rob has a mantra in, in, in ISO for developing standards, and that is SFB. Simpler, faster, better. Uh, and seeing whether we can do that. And the simpler, therefore, is important in the con context of what you're saying. Actually, it should just be easy to do the stuff, you know, uh, and, and, and so it, sh it shouldn't be, it be an added burden. But I think, you know, it was, it was a, a, a great question about, about human behavior uh, and how we put it. So the, the easy answer to you about human behavior is, again, back to ISO, and we don't apply this across all of our technical. Each standard has got a technical committee behind it, which is experts and... In several of the areas, several of the economic sectors of the world, we always make sure that the consumer, that the, uh, the customer, that, that uh, people, if you like, ordinary people, are represented there so that that behavioral aspect can be brought into it, so that, that the, the values can be brought into it as well. And in fact, it was something that I was not expecting that came up in some of the discussions we had last week and this week uh, about, uh, about standards for infrastructure, which then brings me to my point, to my thing I, w I wanted. This is, um, this is a little hypothesis I'm, I'm building up, that I think that we have gone through different phases as we've been delivering my stuff, major projects, into society. Uh, and it almost, I haven't quite got it by decades, uh, because I started out a long time ago. Um, when I started out, if somebody wanted a power station, a metro, a motorway, then all you did is work, work out affordability. Where was the money coming from? Then you got on and built it. Later on, we discovered the value of cost-benefit analysis, and we actually started doing forecasts of use and revenues, or pseudo-revenues, and did cost-benefit analysis. Is it worth these billions that these things cost? Uh, then, a de decade later, and it was a decade after um, uh, Limits to Growth and the Stockholm Conference, when we started thinking, actually, the environment was important. Uh, that's when I, I really started getting involved in, in, uh, in, in major projects. In, in, so that was, that was a decade, I guess, the 80s. Um, uh, and then we start, I'm trying to remember what happened uh, next. Certainly things like private finance came in. The point of where I'm getting to is 
the latest one that came in was trying to understand the sociological impacts of what we're doing. And I, it, was, it was in 1994, was the first time, me, an engineer and an economist, recruited and put a sociologist in my team. And, and I must admit, it was a complete eye-opener to me because I realized what communities were about or the impact on communities and the benefits for communities. So behavioral aspects then came in and now we do take that into account. And can I tell you, if you take community aspects and behavior into account in designing your projects, they become whole step change better in what it is you're trying to produce. So long as, A, you listen, that's me being an engineer, I listen, and B, I am prepared to change. It isn't just done as a process, you prefer to change. So I think it's a fantastic question, thank you. There was a second question just now. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Emma Paris. I'm from the British High Commission here. Um, I have a question about um, with the, the, um, the new ISO for cities, which cities have adopted that so far? Um, and the second part of my question is of those cities who have adopted it, how do you envisage them using it to their advantage or to give themselves an advantage um, versus other cities? So, so this standard is quite new. It was only published um, earlier this year. So to say that a city is now using the whole of the standard uh, would be, uh, would be uh, a lie, because they're not doing that. Um, but there is a lot of interest, and, and a lot of um, cities now starting to, starting to pick this up and starting to, to, to analyze it. So if you ask me this question probably in another two or three years, I could answer it. Um, what I can say is that um, the 36 countries that have been involved in developing the standard are very interested. And you know, obviously, it's a little bit like what Terry said, if you get involved in actually developing something, then it's really helpful to actually help implement it. So we've got uh, uh, countries in Europe, we've also got countries in the developed and in emerging economies doing that. So Sri Lanka, for example, is, is working uh, in this area. Um, I know, uh, yeah, the UK is certainly interested in this area. Um, uh, Switzerland certainly also. Um, so it's kind of a little bit watch this space, but one of the advantages of the ISO process is involvement and engagement and actually getting the stakeholders around the table to actually develop this thing. And there's a lot of enthusiasm for this. This, as I also alluded to in my presentation, there are ancillary standards being developed that will also help support and further explain the standard. So you know, it's, it's very much a, a work in progress, but it's a work in progress that I think is working pretty quickly as yeah, well. And, and Rob, you were telling me before, don't forget, ISO at, at the limit is a publisher. I mean, we're a researcher, developers, and then publish. And you were telling me before, this is a hot sales at the moment. It is selling. Hi, um, thanks very much. Raymond Kwok from Kwok Group LP. Um, Rob and Terry, and can you share with us, um, the ISO is a standard which has been used worldwide. How do we know the standard will be deteriorating over time? Just give an example. The first thing I see I saw was the stocks. How do I know when to throw away the stocks? The stock is not up to the standard now. When I put it on, is it too smelly or I get a hole? I mean, I, I just wanted to know that, you know, how do we monitor, like what you said about a computer, humming behind, how do we know that it is still humming nicely? Um, well, for a start, uh, Rob was saying that uh, this, is, this is an early stage in, in terms of city governance. Uh, but an essential, you know, it, it, I say just publishing a, a, a standard doesn't do anything. Uh, there's a whole process that goes in uh, about, uh, uh, about adopting them, living by them, using them, and then checking back in, a, in a, a conformity loop to look back on it. And that then leads to continuous improvement uh, uh, in, in, how, in how, uh, in how processes improve. And so it is, it is a classic process improvement um, loop uh, that we're looking for. Perhaps just to supplement that, what, what we're also looking at is, you know, is the standard being taken up around the world? Um, as I say, it's too early to, to, for, for this particular one, but let me take uh, a couple of standards that may be familiar to you. The Quality Management System Standard, ISO's probably most famous standard, 
if you're into famous standards, um, is ISO 9001. Um, there are about 1.5 million certificates around the world that have been issued against this standard. Um, and there's a whole lot more of those standards that are being used by, by suppliers, by organisations, by whatever around the world. Um, we have another standard on environmental management that was, that was published. Uh, it actually was a consequence of the Rio summit um, that has now got about over half a million certificates globally and your big uptake from something else. Another example, uh, a standard we published about uh, four or five, four years ago now, um, which is ISO 50001 on energy management um, things. This is a relatively slow uptake, but it's also telling us a little bit more about what are some of the drivers to encourage people to take the standard up. So the latest survey we did, we've got 50% growth, which sounds really cool, but it's from about uh, uh, 5,000 to 7,500 certificates. Um, but what's very interesting there is this is a standard that needs a couple of things. It needs experts to help with the implementation of the standard. So this is driving some you know, a real need to actually get experts to, to help organisations implement the standard. The second thing that's happening is what are some of the uh, carrots that can be put in place to help organisations uh, and countries implement the standard. So for example, there was about 300% growth in Germany for this particular standard. Why? Very simple. The government of Germany provided incentive, some incentives to that. And when you think about this particular subject, that's not an accident because you're being able to re increase energy intensity you know, the, or, or energy efficiency in a, in, a, in a country is really important to that government. So there's a payback there. So one of the things that I think, coming back to this particular standard, that ISO needs to be doing is we need to be publish, publicising it. We need to be working with partners to raise awareness about it across the cities. And we need to be measuring and helping with the measurement of those results. Because there's nothing like a great case study to show that, yes, this is fantastic, this actually works. It's not uh, an esoteric thing. And that, I think, is one of the fantastic things about international standards and, and any standards. They're pragmatic. If they're not pragmatic, they're just going to sit on the shelf and no one's going to use them. Raymond, I'm not sure whether I understood your question correctly, but maybe let me augment that yeah. at uh, two or three levels. One is the, um, to ensure that the standards are sort of relevant and current we have a regular process of reviewing all the existing standards. So at the national level, for Singapore standards, we have a review time frame of every five years. So we make sure that every five years, we dust out the standard, look at it, is it still relevant? Does it still need to exist? Should it be tweaked? Is it based on some old technology or old system that's no longer sort of in the market? And then we adjust it. So that's one at the standards level. The other one is at the sort of compliance or conformity level. So when a company or a process says it complies with or conforms to a particular standard, what does that mean? And how long can you say that you are, it's still complying? It's not for life, right? There has to be regular recertification. So there's a conformity assessment process that's also in place, and that has to be regularly done. Now, whether a particular product that went through a, that whole process that says it conforms with it, whether the product itself conforms with it probably is a case of quality assurance. So it's based on a different kind of standard on how well our quality assurance system is running and so on. So th that's probably the way I'll answer it. There's actually a question from the back and then I'll come back to the gentleman in front, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name's Daniel. I'm from the Urban Redevelopment Authority. Uh, I do local planning, uh, basically land use planning. But anyway, uh, it. It's, it's very clear that standards can be very valuable for cities, but there is also a cost to adopting a standard. You know, it raises issues like path dependency, lock-in, uh, uh, and finding yourself committed to a, a, a choice that has consequences that you did not uh, expect when you made the choice. I give it a simple example. Like uh, in Singapore's case, the choosing of a particular gauge for our metro system, for example, will determine things like how wide the tunnels are going to be, how tight the, the curves can be on the track, how far away the, 
the stations can be from each other, which then has all sorts of implications for the form of the city, what your buildings look like, how they're laid out, how you design uh, neighborhoods and so on and so forth. So in designing the uh, standards for cities, how do we make these costs uh, more explicit? Uh, these trade-offs more explicit, and how do we design a standard that will minimize the risk of unintended path dependency? Yeah. Um, okay, I think it's quite a big leap from uh, from the gauge of a railway to standards for running cities. Um, uh, what we know is that uh, the simple and traditional use of standards over time has been proved time and time and time again to save money, to save lives, to increase quality. Uh, we know that from, and, and in fact, uh, uh, ISO has got, I don't know how many other there are now, but a whole series of business cases for standards, actually looking at case studies, working through it with real examples in real countries, real, real companies and real consumers that actually show what the benefits are, benefits to trading, benefits to uh, using for consumer satisfaction. Uh, so the benefits of having standards for railways are absolutely immense. If anything, they could do with a few more. Not a few more, sorry, that's wrong. We don't need more standards because if anything, there, there's, there's a duplication there. But we could ha do with more cities and countries adopting standards which have been proven elsewhere. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you a. Um, I'm, I'm always accused of of, of, of leaping to silly con uh, 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 examples. In my field, uh, I can take you to um, an, uh, a, a a plant that makes tar for roads, asphalt for roads. It actually produces 248 different mixes of asphalt. None of that is necessary. It's because actually we can't bring standardization. Everybody's got their own views on what it should be. Yeah, maybe you need, a, maybe you need road tar for a busy road and for a quiet road. But that's about it, really. And so in what you're talking about, in the practical things for how to run a railway, we could actually have far more cooperation to come up with common systems around the world. Um, now, what that means for cities, um, I think there is immense scope for increasing efficiency without taking out the individual. You know, we all know whether we prefer, you know, one city to another, or even one district in a city to another one. And we like living in one and working in another, and so on. They've all got character, and but actually, there is immense scope for improving the efficiency in cities by sharing best practice. And when you share best practice, the thing that enables that is by having a common language which standards will provide. Maybe I'll augment that answer with uh, just two points. One is, I think, in terms of inadvertent sort of path dependencies, I don't think it's a function of standards. I think it's going to happen anyway. It happens with or without the standards. I've always sort of tickled by this joke about how the size of the ICBM, you know, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, diameter is dependent on or was based on the size of the horse's backside. <laughs> now that's because the horses carry carriages, right? they, they tow carriages, and then the, over time this became actually the, weight, the, the size of that carriage, the wheels, became the size of the tracks for trains. And trains have to go through tunnels and that became the size of the tunnel. And when different parts of the ICBM was manufactured and assembled, they were manufactured in different places and assembled together, they have passed through tunnels. So that limited the diameter of the ICBM section. <laughs> so this kind of path dependencies, I think, happens with or without the standards. I'm glad I came to Singapore. I've learned something that I'll... <laughs> but I think the second point I wanted to make is, I think as was explained by both Rob and Terry just now, the, the standardization or the standards development process in ISO depends on pulling together um, people with the knowledge, people from the industry, to reach a certain consensus. 
So it may not be the wisest thing, but if you believe in some level of sort of crowd wisdom and pulling of wisdom, then that's already your best bet. You may still make mistakes, and we always do, but uh, yeah, what options do you have, right? Even if you don't do it, you don't keep to a particular standard, you just end up with um, that kind of path dependencies anyway, based on some ad hoc decisions by some particular decision maker at some point in time. Sorry, I think the, the gentleman from the first room. Uh, I'm Li Tzu Yang. Uh, I'm on the Center for Liverpool Cities Advisory Board. Um, first of all, I must admit, I have not read the standard, so perhaps the question that I ask will be uh, answered if I read the standard. Um, but it seems to me that the, um, the grouping or the questions that we ask uh, the standards to, to address uh, are quite fundamental. And when you have uh, something as complex as a city, then the number of needs that you would want to say the city needs to, uh, to satisfy are quite varied. Um, if we were to, uh, within the city standard, and this is why I have not read it, I can't, I can't say, um, try and say how we will individually meet all of these needs, we might come up with a very different solution than if we had grouped them and put them as conjoint needs. So, as an example, when you put in infrastructure, very often the infrastructure can meet more than one need. Uh, likewise, um, if you have a delivery, say, of uh, energy, you also have emissions. So you, perhaps you should have a standard for both energy and emissions together, rather than separately. Um, how does the standard uh, tackle these issues? That's a great question. I, I guess the way the standard is is crafted is it's it's a it's a it's a performance standard of prescriptive measures, if I can put it that way. So it's very much up to the city itself to decide the grouping. It's very much up to the city to decide what's important and what's not. And uh, in that, you, I guess there's not that much guidance. It could be a very good question for the for the technical committee that developed the standard, as I say, they're developing adjunct uh, 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 standards to this uh, standard, and perhaps some, some further guidance or some further examples, for example, could be very, for examples, for example, examples could be very, uh, could be very, very helpful, particularly for those just starting out. And, and I come back to a point I was making before. You know, I think this idea of a partnership between the standards developer in our case, in this case, I so, and and practitioners, uh, you know, the Centre for Livable Cities is is an obvious um, partner. We would be really interested in uh, you know, how, your advice on how we might implement the standard. But at the moment, just to repeat what I said before, the standard makes no judgment on what's absolutely important and what's not. That's up for the city to to to, to decide. And and in that, I think we look to try and cover the diversity of cities and not take away from uh, the administrators or the city planners or the like the, 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 the power, indeed the responsibility that they have to actually decide what's important and what's not. Uh, my name is Ui from Falcon Crest. I have a couple of questions. Would you agree that the ISO has made a lot of consultants very rich and creating jobs for consultants who help in uh, helping clients to, uh, to get certified? Because normally the ISO, if you want to be a certified company, there's a lot of work to do, a lot of documentation, a lot of process, a lot of training. And most companies don't understand how to do it, so they have to hire a consultant. So in a way, I think ISO created jobs. <laughs> the other issue is um, with standardization, um, how do you align yourself with the other group that believes in innovation? Obviously, the people who are in innovation, they don't like standardized stuff. <laughs> they want to be different. So how do you, how do you reconcile these, these two? And also, um, every country has their own standards. 
PS, ASTM, uh, AS, you know, uh, UL. So if you have an ISO standard, would the other countries accept your standard as their standard? Is that equivalent? I don't think so. <laughs> Happy to have your comments. Thank you. OK. I'm, uh, um, maybe, Kaiho, you want to allocate these questions out. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll declare an interest, uh, a conflict of interest, being ISO president and a consultant. So, so, uh, so, so I'll let Rob answer that one. I'll have a go at innovation, if you like. Gee, thanks, Terry. <laughs> Um, three, three questions that we could talk about for the rest of the afternoon. Do we make the consultants rich? Only, I think, if, if you've got some pretty dumb, if they've got some pretty dumb clients. To, to continue the theme of, what you, of the, the way you put your question. What do I mean by that? If there is no value to be seen, then why would you do anything? I would argue, and I would argue passionately, that anybody worth their salt, including consultants, will be looking to add value to their clients. So the idea of looking at just the cost side of the equation rather than looking at the profit side of the equation as well, I think just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Certainly in the past, ISO uh, has been, I think, accused of uh, developing a standard and then sort of standing back and letting, you know, anybody and everybody have a go at, at implementing the thing. We are far more engaged in encouraging good implementation of the standards now. And, and we, we, we would value feedback on how we could do that better. To me, it's very easy to criticise the cost of a standard. And it's far harder to get the value of that standard. And this is why we, as Terry's just said, this is why we've got case studies showing the value of, our, of, of implementation of our standards. Um, for example, here in Singapore, uh, we have uh, a couple of case studies, at least certainly one case study in the retail sector showing the value, the economic value of, of using standards uh, for uh, NUC right pr fair price, sorry, NUC fair price. You know, they just took one, one part of uh, their business looked at the value of using standards in that part of the business and the savings are in the millions of, of Singapore dollars. That I think is a far better way of looking at it. What we need to do is we need to make sure that our standards are, are developed in a way that's easy to implement, simpler. They need to be done in a time period when they're going to be relevant, so they need to be faster, and they need to be better. So some of the things that we're looking at doing is not just developing a book, but developing the answer to particular questions. So we're digitising our, our catalogue, we're looking at how we can work with partners to implement, to, to give people the information they want. So it's a great question, and I don't think, I, I don't think it should just be limited to consultants. I think it should be limited to, to much broader than that, and that I think is, if you are a user of standards, you need to start at the start and say, if I do this, am I going to get some real benefit out of that? So I, I and of course I would say this, being the Secretary General of ISO, I actually think there is huge value in standards. We need to better articulate it. We certainly do not set out to make consultants rich. We set out to make the users of our standards rich and, 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 and more profitable. Maybe allow me to augment that part of the answer and then uh, we talk about innovation. I think maybe philosophically speaking, I want to bring it, bring it to the national level. I think for Singapore's economy, right, um, we're not going to be competing with other economies on price, on, on being cheap, because I don't think we can compete on that basis. So what, on what basis do we compete on? Actually. Part of the answer is we think we can compete on quality. Right? So it's, not, it's always a price quality thing. It's always what benefit you get for what cost. So similarly here, I think the reason why we're interested in standards is because standards is a way of sort of showing and demonstrating that you have that quality to gain that trust. And in some sense, the certification and all those processes are ways by which you sort of QA that, that process of getting your trust. 
So indeed, what Rob said is correct. Right? If you look at the cost, yes, there's a cost to it. But are you able to then sell the value of that trust? Now, the, another small little anecdote that I always hear actually from Mr. Philip Yeo, my chairman, is, you know, actually Singapore does not have cows and therefore Singapore does not have milk. And actually Singapore doesn't even have, even have a lot of babies. But apparently we have a lot of milk powder. Almost every single major manufacturer of milk powder manufactures here, from Nestle to Danone and so on and so forth. And I think there's a function of the, the trust that you demand for a product like milk powder. And you can be selling it at $50, the cost is not $50, but you sell it at that value because that's the value, right? And you have to make sure that you live up to that, that trust. And that's what the process of certification and so on does. I hope that answers part of the question. Innovation. Um, innovation. Um, well, let's start from fundamentals. There are good standards and there are bad standards. There are old standards and there are new standards. And what we're realizing, and, and I've been involved in this, is that standards can be overly prescriptive and might, might work for a short period of time. But if you make standards overly prescriptive, or if you specify products in too prescriptive a way, that will stifle innovation. And so what the trend is, uh, over time, is looking at standards and really trying to work out what you want, what you really, really want. Trying to work out what is the end result, the outcome, the performance. And by specifying performance and outputs, rather than being prescriptive and inputs. You don't stifle innovation, you actually enable it, and in many cases you require innovation. And that's what has happened in many countries, going country after country, uh, the, the transition from local standards in Europe to Euro codes has enabled innovation to happen. Because it's more about performance than it is about saying exactly what type of concrete or what sort of steel or what sort of things are. So that's the simple answer. There's then a whole literature about innovation and how innovation happens. But from the standards perspective, it is that you as a client, as a customer, should be interested in what is the outcome rather than being overly prescriptive. Just to, just to carry on with this discussion, yeah. The idea that standards and innovation as two words fitting in the same sentence, I think, is a, is, is a rather odd concept to, to some people. Let me give you a very practical example about where this, where this really works. So I, we were talking about standards and innovation actually just before lunch. I was at a dialogue uh, session with, that Spring had organised. And I was, I was giving a very concrete example. Um, you've heard of Mercedes-Benz and you've heard of Germany, right? If you, if you look at this from a macroeconomic perspective, um, standards are helping the German economy grow, add about 1% to its GDP each year. That's a, that, that's a result of a study. It's, it's helping that whole economy grow and, and, and prosper. If you take this to a company level, there's a little company called Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz did a study within their organisation and they looked at the value of standards to their organisation. Not just ISO standards, unfortunately, but the whole lot, including their own internal standards. And they made some rather startling conclusions. They place a higher value, value on their standards activity, developing and implementing standards across the board, than they do on their patents and licenses. And if you stop and think about that, that's an extraordinary statement. Because Mercedes-Benz are very protective of their patents and their licenses. You know, if, you look at, if you look at a lot of the innovation that's taken place out of that company, if you take the S-Class Mercedes, the car, which was the first car in the world to have ABS braking? It was the S-Class. 
what was the first car in the world to have inertia reel seat belts? It was the S-Class. What was the, one of the first cars in the world to have active uh, cruise control? It was the S-Class. You can go on and on and on. So here is a company that is using standards as a strategic part of their, of their, of their competitive advantage to innovate and to, and to grow. And the value uh, that they get from that is just enormous. And, and you know, so I, when I show a slide, when I'm talking about standards and innovation, I basically say that I'm stealing, I stole this slide from Mercedes-Benz. Because it's true, I did. But um, that's, a, that's another issue. The, 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 so maybe if I lose, move to your last, last part of your, your question, acceptance um, of ISO standards where there are others, you know, whether it's an ASTM, a UL, uh, a, a BS standard, uh, whatever you want. There's two parts to my answer and, there's, and they actually are a bit contradictory. ISO is trying extremely hard to respond to the needs of industry. We don't sit in Geneva sort of blowing long Swiss horns and eating cheese or chocolate um, and trying to think of new ways to torment industry. We actually are there to try and respond to industry and, and through our members through ISO's members. So we really encourage you to talk to Spring. And if you've got new ideas and what have you, bring them through Spring and into the ISO system. So that's, that's one part of the thing. We're not doing stuff unless industry or other stakeholders are telling us to do so. Equally, the standards world is not a gentle art. It's not a gentlemanly sport. It's a knockdown, drag out fight. And so what you're also seeing industry doing, to be really blunt, is you're seeing industry standard shopping. I get an answer over here, I don't like that answer, I'll go somewhere else. If I don't like the answer there, I'll go somewhere else. Why? Because having a standard where you are controlling this, the pen, means that you're the standards maker and others are the standards taker. So one of the things that ISO is also trying to do here is look at long-term harmonisation of standards. You know, there is no point in having the same standard out there for the same, su or sorry, the same subject being covered by a, a multitude of standards. You would hope to see convergence over a period of time. But it's also a competitive sport. So we, as ISO, hope that the power of our brand, the integrity of what we do, the processes by which we get involved, including broad consensus and wide, wide involvement, actually shows up as you know, real value in having an ISO standard. But in, but in this, we're not the only operator for sure. Yeah, um, uh, and, and it's a fascinating area, and, that's, it, and it is one that I've come to learn about, because I should explain, I haven't spent my whole life in standards in an ISO or a BSI. Uh, I've been a standards user for all of my professional career. Um, and what I, I find really heartening is that whilst it's competitive, it is incredibly, incredibly ethical how it, how, how it works. So the vast majority of ISO standards, if you look through the catalogue of ISO standards, the vast majority originated in a national standards body, in BSI, in DIN, in Spring, in spring or wh wherever they were. They started life as a local country standard, uh, and then, and what happens then is that people are developing standards, quite honestly, just for to make the world a better place. People are developing standards. You don't you don't go into standards development to become a rich person. You go into standards because you actually do believe that it does good for safety, quality, uh, and so on. And therefore, it, the ultimate accolade, and I'll say this, this is now the marketing pitch for ISO, the ultimate accolade of a standards writer or developer is to have that become an ISO standard. It might be a BSI or a DIN or whatever it might be, but you will be so pleased if it then becomes an ISO standard. Now, it isn't just a very easy linear process because the process of getting an ISO standard is incredibly thorough. 
You may have actually written it for, you may have developed it for your local market, but if it's going to go to ISO, it goes global, and those 165 individual bodies all have to agree. And therefore, there's actually quite a process that, that looks across the world and looks, is it applicable? And, and as we've been hearing the last uh, few days, uh, the, the, the adoption of standards into Singapore has to be accompanied by national adoptions and national annexes because, of course, there are particular things that apply here in Singapore that wouldn't apply in other places. And so you take a standard from somewhere else, ISO or SEN, whatever, and then you'll have a national annex that goes with it and makes it local. So I, it, 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 I, I've been fascinated by the, uh, by the drivers of people who prepare these, these standards and where they would like their standard to be eventually. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Deneuville, and I'm here in Singapore as a guest helping to develop from the MIT the Singapore University of Technology and Design, and I'm an engineer. So um, my question has to do with the idea about standards for cities, because we're trying to develop something that is more livable, but it has different dimensions to what quality for a city might be. So for example, in terms of transport uh, or movement, you have the accessibility for pedestrians, which conflicts with accessibility for cars. I mean, do you stop the cars and let people cross the street, or do you make the people walk over bridges and so on? This is a, this is a basic conflict. And again, in, a, in case after case, there are conflicts about what it is. So, if you, so help me understand how the ISO thinks about standards for, say, accessibility or pedestrian access or automobile access, things of that sort which are basically in conflict, where what a city might try to achieve might be quite different between Singapore and Amsterdam or Dallas, Texas, for example. They have different ideas about what is quality. So that what does it mean to have a standard in that sense where they represent or measure different notions of what quality is. That's, so help me understand how you think about it, which is different, of course, from a commercial world where ultimately there be a, a financial bottom line. So I'd appreciate your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Let, let me just um, talk briefly about two, two aspects that you covered, one around accessibility and the other around sustainability. As I said at the start, we have around about 20,000 standards sitting in our catalogue. Many of these standards go this way. They're subject specific. Uh, increasingly, particularly when you start talking about societal issues, you start going this way. You have These are horizontal issues. They go across subject areas. So one of the things that we have done, uh, let's take accessibility as a, as a concept. Um, we have been working for the last five years to update a guide around how you consider issues of accessibility when you are writing a subject specific standard. So the idea of looking at accessibility when you apply it to a city, there are kind of some overarching principles that you need to establish at the start. So it's not ISO telling the city, you know, you must have, I don't know, um, pedestrian pedestrian access to be able to cross the street through through mats for the visually impaired or, or whatever it might be. It's actually trying to set some consistency in, in policy around accessibility. So we have this guide on accessibility. We look to make that available to, uh, to whoever wants to use it, including city planners. Um, and we also ask those who are developing standards to take this guide into account as they write the standard so that we, we are encouraging consistency of, of policy and application on, a partic on, on this issue, um, accessibility. We also have another guide around sustainability. This is another horizontal issue to look at that. So ISO is not trying to dictate you, know, you must have a certain level. What we're trying to say is once you establish the level, then here's how you can be consistent across 
various areas and various subject areas. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's it. I was hoping somebody would ask this question at some point, um, because um, what we, w w when I said earlier that we've been trying to run cities for seven thousand years, then the publication of one standard on on livability and 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 and, and in, is not going to solve solve that. This is not a prescription for bland cities. Um, but what this is just trying to say is, surely we can just all agree on a few things. You know, pretty well we know how to measure pollution in cities. And we'd all agree which way the metric should go. Road accidents, uh, you know, all things like that. And so if you look through this, there are a whole, there, this is not trying to say which choices you should make between them. Because actually there's probably an inverse relationship between um, you know, how, how, uh, how uh, accessible by cars a city is and pollution levels, that might be that. But actually just let have those so that we can all know and we have a common language how to talk to each other. Um, so I say this is not a prescription for bland cities, it is, it is uh, praising, celebrating the diversity of cities. But it's saying among these metrics, it prescribes, it defines how we should look at them. So we've got a common language. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for your insights. And I thought that previous question was very good. Uh, this is Vivian Liu from Philanthropy Works. And I would like to, well, you know, I was part of the team that came up with the uh, governance at the glance standards for countries at the World Bank um, a decade plus ago. So I'm, uh, I understand the uh, complexities that you have to juggle. Um, and I think that perhaps you have to deal with more, as that gentleman has pointed out. Um, as you, I, I'm, it's a little difficult to um, ask more precise questions because you have not made uh, the ISO specifications public. Um, and so it would help, actually, if you could comment specifically on that gentleman's question um, regarding the considerations on movement and uh, the, the needs of different segments of the population, um, perhaps using transport as an example. Does the ISO take that into consideration? Sorry, um, maybe I misunderstood. Um, uh, the, this ISO standard is, is public, you can just down, it's just there. I mean, it's, 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 it, it is a public document. Oh, okay. Um, the page that the link took me to, uh, bas well, basically you subscribe to this report, right? Perhaps that's a different page, so I'll, I'll take another look later. But I, yeah, it's a, book. it's a book. You buy it. So it's a little difficult to have a discussion right now if we are not well briefed on the contents of the book or of your ISO standards. Because you say that you're not prescribing standards for cities. But on the other hand, if you tell people that, oh, you know, we are number one in this and this, there are these rankings, there would be a certain pressure for cities or countries uh, to say uh, why they are not subscribing to it or how they have done. So by having ISO standards or any kind of uh, widely adopted standards, uh, as I'm sure you hope these standards to be, you are setting a certain benchmark. And therefore, you are um, trying to influence the, the development of cities, consciously or subconsciously. I, I, uh, uh, right. I, 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 uh, maybe, maybe there's a misunderstanding. This is not an attempt to establish a league table for cities. Um, uh, that's n not where it's, where it's going again. Um, what, uh, and also, it is, uh, fits right within the whole fundamental basis of standards, is that they are, they are uh, established by consensus and they are adopted voluntarily. Uh, so there's no prescription in, uh, in, in there. Um, but what it describes is, and, and, and Rob, you could, you could uh, take, it, take it up from here, what it prescribes is a series of headings and it is an interesting debate whether this series of headings, which have been developed by the technical committees and agreed by the 165 countries, do describe, this is a bold statement, everything 
that needs to be looked at, managed in a city. Now, as I say, I think that's, that's, a, that's a bold statement. Um, you could actually look through it and see whether or not there are things that you don't think are covered in it, but it does try to be comprehensive in what are the things that a city, city should be having. It then doesn't say that one thing is more important than another, but it just establishes this common language between cities so that people can look at it. And it's, this has been sought after for, for, for some time. Maybe if I could just make three points. First of all, if you go to the ISO website, go into our, um, uh, our web shop and type in the number of the, the standard, 37120, it will take you to a preview of the standard um, and allow you to look at the scope, um, give you uh, the chapter, the, the, the index to the standard, uh, and the bibliography associated with that standard. So you should be able to get a, a pretty good view whether you think the standard is is something for you or not. Second point, the standard is voluntary. It's not there as a, is in any way compulsory. And as I said at the start, the idea is for uh, city planners, um, city administrators uh, and the like, uh, to give them some ideas on what they should or could be measuring, given what their own plans might be or what, or what the particular directions or, or things that um, are of importance to them and their citizens to do. So it's not a competitive uh, exercise at all. It's designed to give people an opportunity to, to, to measure, uh, uh, ideas of measurement uh, on how they might manage issues that they think are of importance. Okay. And, and third point, third point, there are already a lot of, um, well not a lot, but there are a number of league tables that are already being published. So although the standard is not designed for that at all, um, I, I think it would be naive, but he says choosing his words perhaps provocatively, I think it would be naive to think that cities are not competing against each other for, for um, activity, for talent, uh, for people to move to those cities. Um, for example, at the World City Summit, I was speaking to um, the international... Uh, marketing coordinator or marketing manager for the city of San Francisco and he was very clear that San Francisco was working hard to create an environment uh, which would attract young professionals in the IT sector and, and um, uh, service industries and what have you to that city uh, by creating cycle paths, by creating green space, by creating an environment where those very people could come and work. So I repeat, ISO is not in the business of creating league tables. We are in the business of helping managers set and, 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 and manage to, to the, to the uh, metrics that they decide. But you know, there are already league tables out there for, and completely different. Kai Ho, could you share on um, whether there's anything in this ISO city standards that Singapore has not uh, considered? Is there anything that we might be doing differently? Actually, I have not read the 37120 myself. But I think maybe what I can try to do is try to give you a, a different frame of reference so that you can get a sense of what ISO does and what, what ISO standard does not do. The most common standard is ISO 9000. right? So I think we all have a sense what ISO 9000 does. But ISO 9000 probably tells you Let's say just now we we're talking about documentation. It's important to document, right? You establish how important it is for your organization. You establish how robustly you want to document. But I don't think the ISO 9000 dictates that you must be a handwritten document in a recognizable handwriting form or anything like that. It's, it tells you that for, um, for your organization to be managed properly, documentation is important but it does not then go on to give you that prescription that you must do it in a particular way. I think it is the same case here. And like what Rob said just now, the other point is, is voluntary. Right? There is no law that says that if you don't have ISO 9000, you cannot form a company or you cannot operate your business. It's basically a voluntary thing for a person to be on it. 
I think cities will probably be able to use it, not so much to sort of even create a composite index, which was actually my first question. It's, it's quite difficult to create a composite index because the dimensions are all different. And I can't add all the dimensions together and say, nah, this is the magic figure. But I think what would be helpful for any city would be to sort of, if they are looking at creating an index, these are the kind of things they should consider when creating an index about sustainability. These are the kind of things they should consider when creating an index about economics. And then with a proper index, because you can create lousy indexes and therefore come to lousy conclusions. But even with proper indices, then I think what you can do is over time, you can track your progress along this properly created indices to sort of track your own progress in that particular dimension that you're interested in. I hope I'm making sort of making it a bit clearer. Okay. I think there's a question here. Second, second. Hi, I'm Harriet Henneke Major, also from the British High Commission in Singapore. Um, my question is about um, how standards are integrated into international sustainable city programs. Um, Terry, you mentioned in the C40 study, um, it provided a platform for exchange between city mayors. Um, and in uh, my previous role, I came across a program called the Covenant of Mayors, uh, which is a voluntary EU initiative launched, I think, around 2010 or 11, um, where cities sign up to 2020 action plans for sustainable development. Um, and I believe they had some exchange with C40 and, have, and still do. Um, so my question is, kind of how are standards integrated into these action plans? And you may not know that because you may not be familiar with this Covenant of Mayors program, but more generally in these kind of international sustainability actions, is there, is there room for standards to be better integrated into these action plans and programs? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, absolutely there is. Um, uh, for start, uh, the, the C40 work, which I'm, I'm aware of the Covenant of Mayors that was, that was uh, done there, what we were doing in, in C40 was in fact, a precursor, really, to uh, to ISO 37120, because we because nothing existed. Well, sorry, not to say there was a lot of academic work that had existed, but we started creating um, uh, measures so that so that mayors, so that city administrators could actually talk to each other across across there. But it was only partial, um, because as I say, this is this is a surprisingly um, uh, uncoordinated it, uh, area. Um, you know how cities get funded, uh, how they um, how they uh, uh, choose to divide up all their functions are incredibly diverse from one city to the next, and therefore one of the first things we had to work out was who in this city should speak to who in this city because they'll you'll find that they've actually got different departmental responsibilities and so on. So how how can you do that? So how do how do cities learn from cities, um, and and so. Uh, when the primary target of C40, which was about uh, carbon reduction and, and, and overall sustainability, but it was, actually was carbon reduction. That's what, what the, the driver was. So that was nice. It could have been all sorts of other stuff. It could have been about, you know, reven it, it could be about revenues. It could be about culture. But actually, we decided, well, they decided, sorry, we didn't know. It was they decided to target a particular thing, which is how do we decarbonize cities and what are we going to be doing about that? Um, and, th and that worked. It's always good, I think, to ask, you know, uh, not quite single dimensions, but really firm, targeted um, uh, uh, questions for that. That's why now, uh, with, uh, with this new ISO standard coming along, and as Rob was saying, it's early stages yet. It's early stages yet. So we can't say, has anybody adopted it? Are they using it yet? That also is, is really targeted on these different headings. Um, but the example from C40 is by targeting things, you can actually get a lot of traction. A lot of mayors really, um, you can almost see a sigh of relief when they came along, because at last they could speak to each other with the same language, which was not existing there before. Questions there? 
Hi, uh, Benjamin from Elion House. Uh, I have a question for Terry on Arab's work around uh, climate action for cities. And I'm just curious to know if there's any analysis being done on the universe of clean technologies and, and related engineering solution sets, you know, when prescribing best practices. Um, uh, uh, right. For a start, I've got to be careful because uh, this is this is this is this is not an Arab marketing thing. We're, we're talking about ISO, uh, but actually, um, uh, there there is plenty to do. Um, and in fact, I'm going to tell you one which Arab had a minor role in, um, uh, but um, uh, we we were part of a big consortium which produced it, uh, produced clean tech directories from China. Now you might. And I, this was a fascinating process. So the, the, there's lots and lots and lots of that, um, and and you can look around for directories. Uh, it was my first example of open source publishing in uh, in China, and it was absolutely amazing. We managed to produce a pretty comprehensive uh, uh, directory online of clean tech um, uh, sources in China over about a six month period. Um, through, through working through, I say, open source, when, when, when it was just a wiki process that came up with it and we launched it. So I keep saying we, this was not Arab. This was, uh, this was in China um, uh, and, and I think we were just given one of the, Arab were just given one of the, 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 the tasks to do with it. So anyway, the answer is there is, there is plenty there. Just l look it up. I'm sure um, uh, that people from Arab could help you with that, but I'm sure there are plenty other sources as well. Sorry, Mr. Ku, you have a question? No, no. D just to add to the question, it wasn't, it, this is not a, related to Arab, but one of the things that ISO is working with at the moment is we're working with UNIDO, who have a cleaner um, a program uh, particularly in emerging economies, around how you can implement, um, in our case, ISO 50001, the Energy Efficiency Management Standard, uh, and, and put that into emerging economies. So this is a good example, I think, of um, a standard that's been developed with a global application, but we're looking specifically uh, for, to partner, in this case, with a funding agency into developing economies to actually help um, industry in those emerging economies become cleaner, more efficient, more profitable, and all the rest of it as well. Uh, so it's, it's, it, this is quite an interesting exercise for us. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. I think I'll take the opportunity to thank both Terry and Rob for sharing all his, their experiences with us and to thank all of you for being such a wonderful, engaging audience for the last 75 minutes. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Steele, Mr. Hill, and Mr. Tan for sharing your insights and experiences with us. We would now like to invite Mr. Ku to present our speakers and moderator with a token of appreciation. Mr. Ku, please.